Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Primon. So it's now a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning's program. And uh, <clears throat> Stefan Hoffman is professor of psychology at the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences in Boston University, where he also directs the Psychotherapy and Emotions Research Laboratory. He certainly had an outstanding career in the field of cognitive therapies, both as, as a clinician, a researcher, and an educator, and has won many prestigious awards, and in 2015 was selected as a highly cited researcher by Thompson Reuters. So we are very privileged to have him here today to present on the topic of cognitive behavior therapy of anxiety disorders. Thank you very much. I haven't said anything yet. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure being here. Uh, and uh, if you don't uh, understand what I'm saying, it might just be the odd mix between the German accent and the Bostonian slang. So uh, it might not be related to the content at all. Uh, so I have to uh, present this financial disclosure statement briefly and uh, would like to uh, then move on to the learning objectives uh, of today's uh, presentation. Well, I'm hoping to, um, uh, for you to learn a bit about the origins and uh, identify basic principles of cognitive behavior therapy. I'm sure most of you, if not all, are familiar to some extent, but uh, there's a, a significant uh, level of misunderstanding uh, when it comes to uh, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. I hope that you learn uh, ways to enhance CBT by integrating um, adaptive emotion regulation strategies and also recognize the importance of cultural issues. Uh, mental disorders, as, as we already heard, are very prevalent. Um, roughly 40 to 50 percent uh, in the population will have suffered or will suffer or are suffering from a mental disorder, significant mental disorder. This is not just some emotional distress because you lose your job, but rather depression, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, and the like. Uh, a bit more commonly uh, 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 present in women than in men. Uh, uh, and this obviously is uh, linked to an enormous uh, burden to society. Uh, the um, uh, percentage, so as, as I already mentioned, mental illnesses are by far more common than many of the other common disorders that we're all familiar with, such as cardiovascular problems, cancer, respiratory, uh, problems and the like. Um, the overall burden of such problems to society are staggering for the very reason because they're so incredibly prevalent. So mental illnesses outpace cardiovascular uh, problems, cancer, respiratory problems and the like for in terms of cost to society. Uh, the, um, at the same time, however, uh, we do not get treatment. Mental disorders do not uh, get the attention that they deserve. Diabetes, if you have diabetes, chances are that you get treatment. Uh, uh, but aside from schizophrenia, which is a very obvious mental problem, and most people with schizophrenia seem to get some, some in, uh, intervention, uh, anxiety disorders, depression, personality disorders, and the like, they are very much undertreated. <clears throat> These are, by the way, uh, data from, uh, uh, from uh, the recent book by David Layard and David Clark, uh, which is, um, uh, comes from the uh, large dissemination effort that is happening in the UK. Um, uh, uh, Lord Layard is, a, is an economist, uh, uh, not a mental health uh, professional, and he was intrigued by the very fact that why don't we disseminate mental uh, 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 disorder treatments, psychotherapy, if it, 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 because it's a lot more uh, cost-saving by delivering effective treatment than by withholding them. Uh, and he convinced, as a result, uh, uh, the uh, uh, administration in the UK to disseminate uh, uh, psychotherapy, in particular cognitive behavior therapy, and that's why I'm going to say a bit more about CBT. Because of all the psychotherapies, CBT appears to be the most cost-effective form. It's not to say that there are other forms of therapies that are, may, not be, may, may be more effective. <clears throat> they might be um, 
in the future perhaps even uh, more cost effective. But at the current moment, CBT seems to be the way to go. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so for the anxiety disorders group, <clears throat> cognitive behavior therapy is quite effective as compared to pill placebo. Um, so this is, these are controlled effect size. The larger the number, the better it is, the better the, the, the treatment is as compared to placebo. A placebo is something that you're getting and you believe it works, but it really doesn't work. And you, <clears throat> uh, this can be pill placebos, but most often these are also psychological placebos. These are uh, group interventions with people share their problems. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but, but uh, it does not include many of the active ingredients that we believe uh, work for specific problems. <clears throat> So for acute stress disorder, uh, it uh, significantly reduces anxiety. Same with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, CBT is quite effective for those interventions, but also significantly effective for treating post-traumatic stress disorder, social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and to a less extent, but also effective for post-traumatic, uh, for panic disorder. All of these effect sizes are uh, significant, meaning they are more effective than, uh, than the comparison condition, which is, as I said, um, placebo. Interestingly, the red bar is uh, much larger than the green bar for uh, uh, acute stress, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and less so for the other disorders. Uh, the red bar uh, shows a reduction in anxiety symptoms, the green bar the reduction in depression. So even though you treat uh, the anxiety disorder, depression also changes to a significant degree. But it is good for the patient. We want them to improve overall, but it causes, but it, it, it raises some questions as to the specificity of our treatment approach because we do want, uh, ideally, anxiety uh, to be reduced significantly and uh, to some extent also other, other forms uh, of psychopathology. But uh, so we see some, uh, some issues that, uh, that arise in this, uh, this meta-analysis already. So the take-home message so far before I'm diving into now what CBT is and how to improve upon is mental disorders are real and common. Uh, uh, anxiety disorders are one of the three most common disorders, uh, mental disorders. Um, you will ask what are the other ones, uh, substance use and uh, mood disorders. Uh, and anxiety often ranks number two, sometimes number three. Um, they do not lead to, uh, uh, they, they, they do uh, lead to great uh, uh, personal suffering. They also lead to uh, enormous uh, cost to society, as I mentioned, and treating those disorders effectively is to society a lot less costly than withholding effective treatments. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy, so far, up to this point, uh, is the most cost-effective intervention. Now, what is CBT? Um, Dr. Beck um, uh, is often um, considered, and rightly so, as the father of uh, CBT, together with Albert Ellis. Uh, he had some, uh, some it's, a, it's a rather simple idea that turned, that, that started the revolution. It was part of, by the way, the cognitive revolution that swept across psychology that is also associated with names like Jean Piaget, uh, who uh, re-examined sort of how development happens in children. Uh, there is uh, computer science uh, ideas that, that uh, factored into uh, psychology, such as, uh, you know, we have an entire field of cognitive psychology that is based on that, information processing. Uh, there's a, uh, at that time also, uh, social psychologists studied social processes, Schachter, Singer. For those of you who have done some introductory work in psychology, you all have heard these names. This is all part of this larger cognitive movement, this cognitive revolution that is still happening up until today. Joseph Wolpe uh, and and B.F. Skinner and others, uh, they um, uh, based uh, their ideas on basic behavioral principles, trying to understand what are adaptive and maladaptive uh, behaviors and how to modify them in a very systematic way, initially starting with animal experiments, pigeons and rats, and then translating that onto humans quite successfully. The combination of these two approaches cognitive principles and uh, behavioral principles is uh, this marriage uh, resulted in something what we call today cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, it is not at all a new idea. In fact, one could say this is a truism. It's something that is just as true as, 
as the Earth is going around uh, the sun or the moon around the Earth, uh, just as true as that and just as predictable as that. So Epictetus, a, a Stoic Greek philosopher, once said, men are not moved by things, and to be, pre to be you know, modern, people are not moved by things, but the view they take of them. So it's not so much the, the, the stimulus, the thing, the outside world that distresses you, but it's the perception of this thing. It's cognitive appraisal. It's what you make out of it. Uh, being, uh, being poked uh, in, a, in the subway doesn't, just causes pain, but does not cause you necessarily annoyance or happiness, etc. But if you turn around and you see a gun pointing at you, it's a different response you will get than if you turn around and you see a blind man accidentally stabbing you, okay? It depends on the context of the situation. Uh, Beck uh, described it very, uh, very astutely in, in his book, uh, Beck in 1976. I think this is just a beautiful way of uh, describing it. Uh, a housewife hears a door slam. Several hypotheses occur to her. It may be Sally returning from school. I might, it might be a burglar. Uh, it might be the wind that blew the door shut. Uh, the favored hypothesis should depend on her taking into account all the relevant circumstances. A logical process uh, of, of hypothesis testing may be disrupted, however, uh, by uh, the housewife's psychological set. If her thinking is dominated by the concept of danger, she might jump to the conclusion that it's a burglar. Uh, she makes an arbitrary inference. Although such an inference is not necessarily incorrect, it is based primarily on internal cognitive processes rather than actual information. If she then runs and hides, she postpones and offer fits the opportunity to disprove or confirm the hypothesis. So in other words, uh, we have thinking is just one part. It, cognitive CBT is not just changing one thought against another. This is nonsense. If you ever thought that, tell, uh, let me tell you, this is a cognitive error that you're making. It's not changing one thought against the other. Th thinking matters. It has to do with perception, with what you, how you perceive the environment. Uh, behaving matters greatly. If the housewife or this lady uh, hides and avoids, uh, she doesn't have a chance to test the hypothesis, what it is. Uh, and the feeling is obviously quite important, the emotion. And in a way, emotion is sort of all of those three things, if you will. The feeling, the subjective experience, the thinking, and the behaving. And yes, it's arbitrary how we split that, but it makes sense. It makes, uh, it, it makes obvious sense if you running is something different from thinking. So putting this subjective experience, physiology, behavioral response, I would call it, a syndrome of mental disorders. And in fact, all of the typical symptoms could be that you have for any mental disorder could be classified as is it subjective, is it behavioral, or is it, uh, an, uh, uh, um, uh, or is it, is it uh, physiological in nature. The stimulus is being appraised, is being evaluated, and this evaluation determines the emotional response. Now, uh, it's not quite as simple. We know that there are uh, a number of feedback loops that actually maintain the problem, and there are other higher order thinking uh, processes. Remember the, the Beck uh, example that if she has a mindset of being in danger, perhaps she watched a horror movie that triggered a number of schemas sort of that the world is dangerous. Or maybe she had an experience of being having been raped in the past that also changed her schema. Rather than she lives in a very safe environment, she will have a different automatic thought that her happens when she hears the door slam. So these kind of maladaptive schemas, we call them sort of the way we perceive the world. Uh, 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 these are, uh, I would, you can call it also habitual cognitive styles. Uh, uh, they de uh, determine obviously to what extent uh, what kind of conclusion you're jumping to. We also know that attentional processes are quite important um, in that, uh, that it depends on where you're focusing your attention to. Um, you, somebody who's very busy doing homework and hears a door slam, they might not even pay attention to, their, uh, to, the, to the door slam and therefore ignore the door slam. Uh, this then leads to these kind of automatic thinking processes that then trigger this, uh, the physiological symptom, subjective experience, and behavioral response. Now, the problem is that there's a positive feed feedback loop that in that uh, these things are self-sustaining, and this causes the problem to persist. 
In, in, in the case of social anxiety disorder, simplified, uh, just as an example, social anxiety disorder uh, is the most common form of, uh, of an anxiety disorder that you all probably are familiar with. This is an arbitrary case uh, of a gentleman that, uh, uh, that who might have to enter a social situation. Uh, he has this overarching belief that, uh, that uh, he's socially inadequate. He, don't know, he does not know what, how to behave in a given situation. And as a, as a result, he focuses attention on negative aspects of himself, uh, what a, uh, how incompetent he is and the like. Uh, in the situation, then, he will uh, um, be, uh, he thinks that he will be evaluated negatively, uh, which will have negative consequences as a result. He, uh, his heart is beating, his physiological symptoms are sweating, trembling, and, and the like. His subjective feeling, obviously, is anxiety, and perhaps he's then trying to avoid the situation or using things that calms him, that would calm him down. We call them safety behaviors. This, in all of these uh, things, uh, reinforce uh, the, the, his, his basic belief system that the world is, in fact, dangerous and that there's good reason to be uh, scared of the situation because, uh, uh, obviously, he feels all this anxiety. Why else would he feel that anxiety? Uh, so these are a self-sustaining uh, model of social anxiety. You, you, can, you can literally use any case uh, and, 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 and uh, dissect these aspects of the problem <laughs> in such a way <clears throat> to <clears throat> be consistent with the cognitive model. So the implications so far are, number one, cognitions mediate and moderate, to use a more scientific term, uh, emotional response to stimuli. And uh, modifying these maladaptive cognitions, these thinking patterns, these, these uh, interpretations, improve emotional disorders. Um, the, there's, by the way, now a very critical distinction between initiating factors and maintaining factors that many um, people, oh, so thank you so much, Evan, uh, that uh, many people don't quite appreciate. Uh, ju uh, the, it is, we, we don't really know why this gentleman developed social anxiety disorder in the first place. And we don't really, to, to be a bit, uh, uh, mm, how should I say, a bit uh, confrontative, we don't really care. Uh, because we don't really worry about what the, uh, there might be a lot of things in the past that might have led to that. There might be, a, might be some relationship issues with his parents, maybe with friends. There might be, there might be basic insecurities that, uh, that led to that. The problem is though, knowing these factors, what led to that, does not give you any tools or not many tools to change the here and now. In order to change the here and now, you need to identify what maintains the problem, what is responsible for the problem here and now, not so much what, what, what happened in the past to this gentleman. Now, this is a critical point that I need to make, uh, that just knowing the, the reason for something does not tell you the solution to the problem. In order to know the solution to the problem, you need to know what is maintaining the issue here and now. And often, the maintenance factors are different from the initiating factors. Something started it, but you can't correct it anymore anyway. But the reason why it's maintained is very different. And that's what you need to change. This is not to say that we shouldn't go back into the past and figure out that it shouldn't happen again in the future, because otherwise, the same problem will reoccur. Absolutely, you should. You shouldn't you know, be constantly abused over and over again. You should move out of the environment so you can, can prevent it. But in order to understand what is happening um, uh, uh, in, uh, currently, you need to understand the here and now. Another misconception when it comes to CBT is <clears throat> it's too <clears throat> mechanistic and you ignore relationship aspects. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I just wanted to show you a, the rating scale that I use as a CBT rater to rate other CBT sessions. And I uh, uh, just want to, to point out this, these scales to illustrate that these are very relational in nature. Uh, we, um, to the highest rating uh, a, a therapist gets if the therapist works uh, in, on the agenda uh, and, and you have to, meet a uh, cutoff uh, on a number of those dimensions in order to, 
to say, for us to say, yes, this was a good CBT session, or no, this was a bad CBT session. So a good CBT session is the therapist um, works with the patient to set the agenda, uh, to target the problem suitable for a, uh, within an available time. Uh, the, uh, uh, the therapist uh, was especially adept to eliciting and responding to verbal and nonverbal feedback throughout the session, um, such as eliciting uh, reactions of sessions, did you understand it, and the, and the like. Uh, the uh, uh, again, understanding is important. Did you is 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 the therapist working within the 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 mindset of the patient in the personal effectiveness? The therapist displays an optimal level of warmth, concern, confidence, genuineness, professionalism, uh, and the like. Uh, collaboration. The collaboration seems excellent when and then the therapist encourages the patient as much as possible to take an active role during the session. Uh, pacing is good, Thera uh, uh, should be good, pa so the therapist uses the time effectively. Guided discovery, something not overly unique, but, but, but a very characteristic as aspect of CBT in which the uh, therapist was, is uh, especially uh, adept uh, of using guided discovery during the session by asking guided questions rather than telling him, no, you need to think that, rather than, well, tell me what you're thinking and uh, uh, let's, uh, let, let me explore, let's explore together if it's adaptive or maladaptive. Focusing on cognitions and behavior obviously is an important uh, aspect. A strategy of change, um, uh, such that the therapist follows a consistent strategy to change that seems very promising. Uh, the application of cognitive techniques in general, uh, therapist is skillful and resourceful, employs CBT techniques. And finally, homework is an important aspect of CBT. We think that a, uh, what's happening during the session is sort of a, a way of reflecting what happened in the past and what will happen in the future, but rather the hard work that happens during therapy often happens between sessions, not in session. In session is we process it, we try to understand what happened in the week before, but it's not, I mean, the, the therapy is not restricted uh, to only the uh, 45 or 50 minutes of time that you see the patient every week, not at all. <clears throat> so, um, let's talk about innovations. And this is sort of more what I've uh, so far uh, uh, um, uh, described uh, was sort of a more traditional uh, CBT uh, uh, approach. Uh, the, and CBT is very much of an evolving science, really. CBT is also a very big tent. CBT is not just Beckian CBT, right? Today, CBT is a very broad uh, um, a family of treatments, and it subsumes uh, interventions that you will all hear today uh, about, and we all will, would consider that, I would consider that, and I know Dr. Beckwood and many others would consider this to be uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, that includes dialectic behavior therapy, uh, except, uh, uh, ACT, uh, mindfulness strategies, and the like. Uh, these are, I would call, uh, innovations, in innovative uh, strategies that apply, uh, that, that, that are uh, for, for it to enhance the efficacy and, and tailor it more to, to, to specific uh, psychopathology. So insight from emotion research taught us a lot about how to improve uh, CBT. Uh, mindfulness practices. In fact, they started as, as mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Uh, uh, mindfulness itself seems to be quite uh, efficacious, and we have good reason uh, to, um, to also understand, uh, to, to believe why we understand how mindfulness works within the general CBT framework. Um, the, uh, the, we, uh, the focus on positive affect, I, I believe, is in the next step uh, in, in uh, innovation. Uh, we are overly focused on, on alleviating negative affect, uh, but we really don't, we, we believe that if you take away the negative affect, the feeling bad, somehow magically people will feel better, but this is often not the case. Uh, often you need to work on positive affect for positive affect to enhance, and this has to do with you know, purposeful life with happiness, with, uh, with, with having a goal in life rather than not feeling miserable anymore. It's fine not to feel miserable, and there's nothing wrong with not feeling miserable, but you want to feel also better, not just not miserable, and these are two different things. Uh, interpersonal factors are quite important that also have not been overly systematically examined. This is a very, these are uh, important to also understand how people use other people to regulate their own emotions. 
um, and uh, context and culture. And some of them I might not have enough time, and so I will have to jump through. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to. We start a bit late, so you so can give yourself. Oh, okay, great. Um, so the uh, the emotion regulation is a is a is a. A very broad literature at this point. It actually came from social personality psychology, in particular. This is a model by James Gross uh, that is a bit, I would say, um, at this point restrictive because it's a sort of a, ge a general input-output model. But it gives us some uh, some think some 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 food for thought, some material to think about. So there's a uh, according to this model, uh, emotions are being regulated at various stages of input, if you will. Uh, so there's a, you initially need to select the situation, and then uh, the situation may be modified, but then you at, uh, employ your attention to certain aspects of the situation, and then uh, it depends on how you appraise the situation. This goes back to obviously the core of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and then once the situation is Praised, it then leads to a, a, a buildup of emotions, and then once the emotion is built up, you have ways to 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 change that. You might suppress it, which is tends to be really bad. Suppressing emotions don't really work well, or you can accept it. You can simply stay with your emotions. That seems to work quite well, actually, in terms of handling negative affect. Or you can. Um, um, uh, or you can, again, you can reappraise that in order for the buildup to, uh, uh, so for you to avoid the buildup. So uh, the uh, mindfulness is linked to this earlier idea of accepting your emotions, of not trying to do anything with it. Not, certainly, if you will, suppression is in a way a counter to my being mindful. You can't be both. You can't suppress your emotion and be mindful to your, to your emotion. You can't accept your emotion and suppress your emotion. You either suppress it or you accept it. So we know that suppressing, generally speaking, is bad. I could do an exercise with you now, if we had time, I would, in a smaller group, in which I asked you not to think of such a thing such as a white bear for a minute. Now, just the fact that I asked you not to think of this white bear will make this white bear pop into your head over and over again. In fact, you're thinking right now of a white bear, even though I instructed you not to think of a white bear, right? So uh, suppression doesn't work. Uh, in fact, and, and just think that this would be a, 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 an unpleasant thought, maybe a, an experience you had, maybe, an, maybe an, 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 a, a sexual assault uh, uh, experience that you don't want to think about, and it keeps popping into your head. Or you might be a religious thought that you don't want to have, uh, and it keeps popping into your head because the, for the very reason you don't want to think about. Mindfulness, on the other hand, is the opposite, is embracing it, is not doing anything about it, uh, and letting it be there, process by which a mental state is characterized by non-judgmental awareness at the present moment experience, including one's sensations, thoughts, bodily states, consciousness, environment, while encouraging openness, curiosity, and acceptance. A very vague definition, I understand, but this is the, the nature of mindfulness. Is a bit, it, it, it's, it, it includes a lot of different aspects. Simply sitting there and being in the here and now, uh, experiencing your, your, maybe your, your breathing uh, would be an example of, uh, of being mindful. You can do anything mindfully. You can drink mindfully, eat mindfully. You can live mindfully or mindlessly. You can, you can be uh, distracted by your thoughts, by your automatic uh, thinking patterns, and you uh, you might drive mindfully or not, or drive not mindfully. You can do anything in your life, mindfully or non-mindfully. And in fact, if you're not mindful, if if you're mindful, it tends to be enjoyable. If you're not mindful, it tends to be whatever you do not enjoyable because you want to be somewhere else. So using your i iPhone, checking your email while while something beautiful is happening. Uh, will take you away from whatever is happening around you because you are so focused right now on the mind. Now, you can also use your iPhone mindfully if you wanted to do that, but few people do that. <laughs> this is a, a busy slide, and I'm, I apologize. I just want to point, you, point out just two numbers, actually. This is a, a large meta-analysis that we did to examine how mindfulness practices uh, improve uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression. 
without explicit cognitive intervention, and they do quite a bit. Simple, simply mind, uh, mindfulness practices in these meta-analyses show that it reduces anxiety disorder symptoms at, a, a, at 0.97. It's a very large effect, by the way. But effect size of 0.8, we're very happy with because we consider that to be large. And even in people who do not have an anxiety problem, but, but, uh, but but we uh, studies that measured some reduction in anxiety, even for those, the uh, anxiety uh, is reduced by uh, 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 at an effect size of 0 0.63. We have the same uh, uh, phenomenon for depression. Depression also changes uh, dramatically uh, uh, simply by, by practicing, um, using mindfulness practices. And there's a recent um, article just published in, um, in the JAMA Psychiatry uh, uh, showing that mindfulness-based current behavior therapy uh, is, in fact, very effect uh, quite effective. Uh, now, you can integrate, and again, sorry for this busyness of the slide, you can integrate these, these mindfulness practices into CBT quite effectively and quite, quite well, and other emotion regulation strategies. And if you do that, so one, one could argue, well, perhaps, perhaps as, uh, as you do the treatment, anxiety changes, and then people become also more mindful, right? But I would argue it's the it's the it's the opposite. It's the the other way that mindfulness and other adaptive emotion regulation strategies directly lead to changes in anxiety. And this is true for uh, for anxiety and depression. This is a lag. Uh, transform uh, analysis in which we examine whether changes in mindfulness at time one and other emotion regulation strategies predict changes in anxiety symptoms at time two. It's exactly what we find, by the way. So the upper slide here uh, shows that emotion regulation at time one um, uh, 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 significantly predicts changes in anxiety at time two, but <clears throat> changes in an <clears throat> but anxiety at time one does not uh, significantly predict uh, emotion regulation in time two. And the same is true for, for depression. So that got to us thinking in, in integrating sort of a, uh, these aspects into a larger uh, model of emotion regulation. <clears throat> Here, you, uh, here we integrate, so we, affective style is a general construct of some people are, are simply more positive than, uh, than others. And you probably know people, maybe you are one of them, who just, no matter what, what, what you know, life throws at you, you kind of make it work and, and it's not going to shake you much. And they're just, no matter what trauma happens to these people, they're always happy. It kind of drives you crazy, right? So the, uh, there, there's certainly a certain diathesis that people have. And some people like little things, you spill coffee and you're, you're breaking out into tears, right? So, the, uh, and so that this affective style can, leads to either positive <clears throat> or negative affect. Negative affect, again, <clears throat> is sort of a general construct of feeling bad, of the, not uh, having negative emotions. But the, and this negative affect, a dysregulation of negative affect, uh, leads to this dysregula uh, 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 leads to emotional disorders. Uh, and certainly, CBT effectively targets this dysregulation of negative affect. We do not target so far. We haven't targeted a positive affect in any significant in a in a major way. And I think this is a new innovation that we need to do in in CBT, in which we try to try to lift also positive affect. We know that. Uh, People, by, by doing so, by lifting positive affect, it also has a beneficial effect on emotional disorders and um, brings the distress down. <clears throat> uh, one uh, such uh, method is, is self-compassion. Uh, so it's, a, it's also a meditative strategy in which people focus, um, lift their positive affect by actually caring about themselves. Um, we are not only not very compassionate individuals sometimes, we're also not often not very self-compassionate individuals. We're kind of too hard on ourselves. We are, we sometimes need to be, give our, cut our, cut slack, cut, cut our slack ourselves, like be, be kind to us. Uh, there are strategies to do that. There are meditative strategies to do that. If we do that, um, we know that self-compassion uh, uh, can be quite effective, especially on the rightmost slide, for those with really severe depression. Uh, Self-compassion actually works better than traditional CBT. Uh, for those with low levels of depression, 
CBT, traditional CBT outperforms self-compassion uh, self meditation. So obviously then combining these things should be more effective in general. Uh, we also know that self-compassion is, is an independent predictor of anxiety and depression, independent of automatic thoughts. This is really all I wanted to say in this busy slide. But, uh, so it's not, it's not, it doesn't work through thinking patterns. It, has, it, it is something separate, something different. That brings me now to, um, uh, to the last portion of my talk. And just how many minutes do I have for that? Five to ten, good. Uh, so far we sort of, I, I, I presented you sort of the, a, a person with a mental disorder as a single individual. And, and stimuli come in and we do something in your, in your mind and we appraise and so forth. And, and, but this is not us. We are not just uh, isolated people. We don't live on isolated islands on our own. We are connected. We are connected with other people. Some are very close in proximity. Some are close to us. And others are more distant, especially people from the past that still influence us. Plenty of them. We grew up with other people, and they, they matter. They are in us. They, people today remind you of somebody in the past that will affect you. So we are social animals, and we cannot, we not, we cannot ignore that. Uh, at any point, you are sort of at a given point of in between the past and the future, if you will. And whatever is now will be different in the future. And uh, whatever will be in the future is different from now. So uh, this interpersonal aspect is quite important. And we have also not examined that in great detail. So uh, I'm just going to illustrate it with one particular case. So let's assume. Um, a uh, Kathleen. Kathleen is a uh, patient of yours uh, who's suffering from panic disorder and, uh, and agoraphobia, and she uh, is afraid of going to the mall. All right. So Kathleen is obviously, as a good therapist, you would um, you would you would do con uh, exposure therapy with her. Now there are different ways how Kathleen regulates her emotions, and. All I want I will do all I want to do is now to make you mindful of this because one so there are, there are these four possible scenarios. In one case, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Kathleen um, may ask uh, her husband uh, to accompany her to the mall. Uh, and, uh, and that is sort of a response. We call it in, uh, intrinsic uh, response independent uh, emotion regulation strategy, an interpersonal emotion regulation strategy. So uh, Kathleen might say then to herself, I, um, I will, uh, I'll, uh, you will stand by me. It, I feel good because my husband is now there and you, my husband, will stand by me. Or the husband is, is not available. Maybe she doesn't have a husband. So, so you, Dr. Sarah, let's assume you're Dr. Sarah, uh, she agrees to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to accompany Kathleen to the mall. This is a slightly different scenario. Uh, and uh, Kathleen might feel something like, you will rescue me, you know? So just because the husband can't really do much. He doesn't know anything about psychology or panic disorder and so forth. Just being there, the price present is, is, is nice. But with, with Dr. Sarah, it's a different story. She can do something and intervene, and, and in case she has a panic disorder, a panic attack, uh, Dr. Sarah is there. Now also, the emotion regulation goes the other way, obviously, because um, the husband, uh, in the first case, he, um, he, he regulates Sarah, uh, uh, um, uh, Kathleen's emotions by, by feel my love, like, you know, so Kathleen's uh, husband uh, uh, suggests to Kathleen, Kathleen that I'm, I'm going to bring you to the mall because I care for you and, and I want to be there with you. And, and Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah is, uh, well, I, I need to make you feel better. This is my goal as a therapist, therefore I'm going to accompany you to the mall. So my point here is that there are two, two in this diet, there are, there are two fairly powerful ways how, how Kathleen's uh, emotions are being regulated by, by other people. Uh, in therapy, you need to be aware of that. What role you have in rec by re uh, regulating uh, the, um, uh, your patient's emotions, but also be aware that your, your patient uses you to, um, to regulate her emotions and also has other people around her that regulate her emotions. Now, culture, to, make, to add to this complexity, um, uh, makes it even more complicated. Culture sort of is a is a is a 
It's very difficult to define, but, uh, but I show you a few pictures that illustrate what culture is. Um, this is a chicken, and this is a lobster. You know both of them. No, they, will not, uh, they will not cause you a lot of distress unless you're uh, a vegetarian or lobster hater or something. Um, but uh, these slides are rather unpleasant. So this gentleman eats some, some worms. Uh, this uh, woman eats scorpions. There's a, a platter with all sorts of critters on there that are roasted that people actually eat. And this is something that they eat in Peru. Uh, these are, these are uh, examples of, of uh, simple, you know, different cultures eat different things. And people from one culture find some things distressing and others don't because they eat that. Um, same is true with emotions. Um, so we have strong differences in emotions, uh, in, in emo uh, emotional disorders between different cultures. Within the US, only within the US, we looked at how common are these common uh, uh, dis anxiety disorders. Uh, social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. The white bar is the white Americans, the black uh, the African Americans, the grayish, uh, the Hispanic Americans, and uh, the striped ones, the Asian Americans. As you can see, almost consistently, except post-traumatic stress disorder, white Americans uh, show a lot more social anxiety disorder. Uh, uh, these are based on very large data, this is epidemiological data. We interview thousands and thousands of people. This is part of the uh, NCSR data. Uh, and uh, African Americans, Hispanics are in between, and Asians uh, are striped. So the Asians are the tough guys, the white ones are the wimps, and uh, African Americans and Hispanics are in between. Uh, this is true for, for uh, except PTSD. P in PTSD, uh, African Americans report uh, are, are most commonly endorsed. Uh, it's a very simple point here, but, but we, we need to be aware of this. Uh, so these are ethno, uh, uh, physiological, psychological factors, contextual factors that you need to fac uh, that you need to consider. I'm going to jump into some examples that are quite intriguing. So I'm. I've been working with colleagues that specifically study cultural expressions of, of mental disorders. One very interesting one is uh, our Kiala attacks. Kiala attacks from Cambodian refuge, uh, refugees that are uh, that were uh, 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 refugees from the Khmer Rouge uh, era. Uh, who uh, we have a very large. Um, uh, population of those in uh, in Boston, and uh, my psychiatry friend uh, uh, Devin Hinton um, has been studying those for many years. Uh, these are chiolites, so these are these are expressions of panic disorder that are unique to this particular population. I just want to give you an example. The typically panic in Western cultures, panic patients, we know we Westerners know that we have a heart that beats and that sometimes stops beating, and then you're dead. Uh, now, uh, Cambodians also believe that they have uh, that there is a heart, but they also believe that that, that their body works slightly differently, uh, not to Westerns, but but is more sophisticated than just a beating heart. They also believe that there is a an, uh, that, that there is a that there are arteries, uh, and uh, and there's a room in these arteries uh, that is filled with air, and this air needs to go the opposite direction to the blood flow, and if this air uh, this ear can be blocked, uh, can be blocked in particular at the neck. It's called, they call it the sore neck syndrome. And, uh, and when, the, when, a, when the person with, uh, when, when this blockage is all of a sudden released, it will lead to, uh, uh, to brain trauma and they will die. So it's not sure about the panic disorder is not focused on the heart, but it's actually focused on their neck. They believe that this is called a sore neck syndrome. And actually, the the, uh, the the healer or the the doctor would use a coin and rub against the neck to release this pressure. They call it coining. So it's a very different expression of panic disorder. The symptoms are not heart focused, but neck focused, based on their understanding of how their body works. I can go through uh, some other examples, but they are just some typical ones: Taishin Kyofushu in Korean and uh, Korea and Japan, which people are are concerned not about embarrassing themselves, but, embarrass, uh, but doing something that embarrasses the other person. Very difficult to wrap your head around, but they um, attack is denervious, with some, uh, more from Puerto Rican and Dominican Republic culture. We're also examining that. And uh, Xing Shu, Sen Shu. Um, uh, so to conclude, CBT is an effective treatment with a sound empirical foundation. It is an 
evolving science. It is not a, a treatment that is set in stone, but rather we are developing CBT as we talk, um, uh, as we're talking, and, and recent innovations in CBT for anxiety dis, uh, disorders, uh, as I mentioned, uh, include enhancing um, general emotion regulation strategies, in particular focusing on mindfulness practices, which seem to have a um, lot of promise, hold a lot of promise, uh, enhancing positive affect uh, through other mindfulness practices such as compassion meditation, um, and also loving kindness meditation, by the way, is another effective strategy. Uh, enhancing interpersonal emotion regulation strategies um, by kind of understanding where the patient is situated and what social context and using this, uh, the, the social context in treatment will be quite important. And also being aware of what, what role you as a therapist play in regulating the patient's emotions. And finally, uh, we need to be, we, we cannot impose our Western ideas on, uh, on, on, especially when working with other clients from other, uh, other cultures. Uh, we need to be fully aware of their, uh, their cultural background. And if we are not, we need to educate ourselves in order to treat them effectively. And um, uh, these are uh, some books that I want to uh, show you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. So we now uh, have time for some questions. I'd ask you if you would line up behind the uh, floor microphones if you have a question or a comment. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. Um, can you expand more on non-meditative strategies to self-compassion in CBT? I understand the loving kindness meditation practice, but could you talk about some other self-compassion strategies that might fit in line with more traditional CBT? If they exist? I don't think they exist. So uh, you're asking about uh, ways to enhance self-compassion using yes. using traditional CBT techniques. Yes. I think I, I think general schema schema work uh, would would I would, would fall into that. Uh, so how sort of examining self-perception, uh, but again, it, you target more sort of the negative tend tend to target more the negative uh, aspects sort of the. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, trying to understand what what the what uh, schema. I think schema work would be the most most uh, most overlapping. So you know, uh, Young's uh, Young's work on on schema therapy, uh, which uh, which identifies uh, sort of what self self uh, regulatory processes as well. But it's but but in terms of lifting also positive affect in general, I would I would say that there's a bit of a uh, a, a uh, deficiency, I would say, in our current uh, 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 techniques that we have available. Thanks. That was uh, that was a really great talk. Thank you. So, one thing I wonder is um, about your statement that um, CBT is is evolving. My question is about how it's evolving, and so. Studies and you know the large meta-analyses showing the effectiveness of a treatment does not necessarily prove or support the hypothesis for why that treatment is working. Now, one thing that could is demonstrating biological plausibility of those hypotheses. And so I'm wondering how studies of biological plausibility of the underlying foundation of this treatment might be guiding its evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, again, I think CBT is a very broad tent uh, that includes, um, uh, you know, different um, different ideas to come from, and probably the most influence right now, I would say, is coming from two directions. One is from the ACT community, probably, that is much more rooted in um, in sort of basic behavioral uh, principles, which overlap for some odd reason with mindfulness, but but it is uh, uh, a strong strong influence from this direction. Sort of to what extent we can 
uh, capitalize on on, uh, on on some of these basic behavioral principles that, however, also bringing sort of dimensions into questions such as you know purpose in life, where are you going with that, what is the value uh, that you that you place on on certain issues, and then the other uh, direction how CBT is evolving is uh, through um, uh, through the influence of neuroscience, and I haven't spoken much about that, but I think there's a um, we we are uh, working on on also a number of studies showing pretty strong. Um, uh, you can use imaging data as predictors and and perhaps even uh, assign people to specific strategies based on based on biological markers. So I think there is a um, the, the field is opening up a lot uh, and, uh, and and and. And science is the co commonality, I'd say. Um, so if you have data showing effects and a model that links it with this, uh, you, it's, everything is fair game. If you have just some vague ideas uh, without much data, um, uh, there is not much room. Yes. Follow up to that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, of those, uh, of those uh, neuroscience studies that you mentioned, or th this body of knowledge that, that, you, that you refer to, have there been any findings that have been particularly uh, surprising or inconsistent with what you would have expected? Um, interestingly, uh, so far, no. Uh, <laughs> so we have, uh, there's one um, recent, uh, uh, and there are not a lot of studies out there, by the way, but the uh, most recent one that I also was engaged uh, in, involved in was, a, uh, was published in Molecular Psychiatry, uh, showing that um, and predicting functional connectivity data, um, to what extent we can predict treatment response based on functional connectivity. And uh, that showed that uh, um, um, identifying amygdala as a seed region uh, showed that the stronger connection of the amygdala to prefrontal activation is the uh, a better treatment outcome was, which is obviously quite consistent actually with um, uh, with some of the general CBT ideas that it has to do with uh, you know inhibitory influence on the amygdala that uh, is associated with treatment response. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for a very interesting and very informative presentation. Thank you.